good morning, everyone, or good afternoon, uh, depending on where you're joining us from. Uh, as this is a discussion about Nigeria, and since the event is online, I do hope and expect that we'll have some uh, viewers joining us from Nigeria, if not further afield, that being one of the few silver linings of this uh, pandemic era that we're in and our subsequent shift to online events. Uh, my name is James Barnett. I'm a research fellow at the Hudson Institute. I mostly study uh, politics and geopolitics in Africa, particularly East Africa, as well as Nigeria. Um, later this spring, I'll actually, uh, fingers crossed, assuming no more pandemic-related restrictions come into place, I'll be heading to Nigeria as a Fulbright Research Fellow at the University of Lagos. So the book that we're going to be discussing today is uh, quite timely from my perspective, uh, and I very much enjoyed reading it in anticipation of my travels. And so I'm very happy to uh, be able to discuss um, this subject, um, that of Nigeria, the nation state, uh, post-colonial governance in Africa, um, with the book's author, Ambassador John Campbell, who we're very fortunate to have joining us today. So without further ado, I'd like to introduce uh, the ambassador. John Campbell is the Ralph Bunch Senior Fellow for Africa Policy Studies at the Council on Foreign Relations in Washington, DC. He is the author of the new book, Nigeria and the Nation State, Rethinking Diplomacy with the Post-Colonial World, which we'll obviously be discussing today. And he writes the blog for CFR called Africa in Transition. From 1975 to 2007, Campbell served as a US Department of State Foreign Service Officer. He, twice, he served twice in Nigeria as political counselor from 1988 to 1990 and as ambassador from 2004 to 2007. Ambassador Campbell, thank you for joining us today. Thank you so much for having me. Our pleasure. So our discussion today will be focused on your latest book, Nigeria and the Nation State, which I have a, a copy of here. It's a very nice, nice little cover. Um, available where books are sold, which I believe is mostly amazon.com these days, but um, right. Right, I encourage everyone to take a look. Um, so in this book, you essentially seek to explain to predominantly a Western audience that Nigeria is not a nation state in the conventional sense of the term and the way that we often think about international relations in the West. Um, you argued that Western officials have kind of long projected their own image of modern governance, of modernization, of what it means to have patriotism or civic nationalism, et cetera, that they've projected this onto Nigeria, even though those frameworks or standards don't exactly apply to the country. And the result, um, you argue, is that American officials have kind of long misunderstood the U.S.-Nigeria relationship, which you believe is, is a crucial relationship. And so I guess my first question to get this conversation uh, kicked off, um, if you had to the opportunity to sit down with, with President Biden today, how would you sell him on the U.S.-Nigeria uh, relationship? What are the stakes of U.S. policy in Africa? If you had to argue succinctly, quickly, no malarkey, as he likes to say, what would you say to convince him that uh, the U.S. relationship with Nigeria um, and U.S. foreign policy in Africa more generally should be a priority uh, for this administration, for the U.S., given all the other myriad problems and, and challenges in the world? Um, I would start off by, by saying that Africa in general, and Nigeria specifically, is becoming far more important to U.S. national interests than it ever has been in the, um, in the past. After all, we were never a colonial power in Africa, Liberia being a, a sort of quasi-exception. Um, the economic links between the United States uh, and Africa uh, have never been very great. Uh, economic link links with Nigeria actually were at one time quite important. Uh, while I was ambassador, we were importing a million barrels of oil a day from Nigeria. And successive Nigerian governments indicated that if the flow of oil from the Middle East to the United States were to be cut off for political reasons, they would do what they could to increase production. That's now no longer a factor. Uh, and we, in, in fact, import very little oil from Nigeria. Uh, all of that said, uh, Africa and Nigeria are a uh, increasing salience, uh, in part because of demography. Um, 214 million Nigerians now projected to displace the United States as the third largest country in the world by population in, by 2050. Um, secondly, uh, uh, there is uh, uh, the matter of security issues uh, straight across the Sahel, there are jihadi movements uh, which are uh, hostile to the West, uh, which seek to overthrow 
uh, the Nigerian government and to replace it uh, with uh, essentially an Islamic form of government, not terribly different uh, from the Islamic State uh, uh, in the Middle East. I would maintain that right now, it is not a threat to US security, certainly it could be in the future. And at present, it is a threat uh, to US interests insofar as US interests involve maintaining stability uh, uh, in West Africa. Then thirdly, uh, particularly in this era of pandemic, uh, there is the important issue of disease and public health. Um, it's worth remembering that both HIV and Ebola uh, emerged from Africa in part because of the progressive destruction of the rainforest. Uh, that process is continuing. We have to anticipate that uh, there will be more diseases in the future that will jump from animals uh, to, to, to humans. And we all know uh, that if an infectious disease emerges in Lagos today, it will be in New York tomorrow or at the very latest um, uh, the day after. And then there's a general question of governance. Um, uh, Americans, uh, for good reason, uh, favor a democratic trajectory. Um, some African states are moving uh, in, in that way. Others are in fact uh, in a kind of recession um, Nigeria is somewhere in between, um, a government which is weak, uh, but increasingly authoritarian, one in which uh, human rights uh, are a declining priority, uh, particularly in the face uh, of, of security issues. So you put all that together and you add to it the question of food security, uh, Nigeria, with its 214 million people, can't feed itself. Uh, how is it going to feed 450 million people? Um, this is a, a problem that is particularly acute in Nigeria, but it's to be found elsewhere in Africa. And we have to consider that it will lead eventually to large-scale population movements. Um, already, in fact, um, um, persons of African origin seeking to cross the Mediterranean to Europe uh, are predominantly from Africa, not from the Middle East. <clears throat> Massive population movements are inherently destabilizing. Uh, so all of this means that we need to focus on Africa and Nigeria specifically uh, to a great, much greater extent than we did in the past. Right, and, and Nigeria has even been called kind of the gateway to Africa or, or the giant of Africa in the past. So, Absolutely. And, 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 I, and I think as you, you make a compelling argument in your book that, um, you know, many of the challenges that Nigeria faces are not, you know, they're, they're unique to Nigeria in the extent that there's, there's no country quite like it on earth, um, of course, but also, you know, some of those issues of kind of the, uh, the colonial state building process, um, the colonial nation building process, or rather lack thereof, um, you know, these are issues that, uh, that many other uh, countries in Africa and elsewhere um, in the post-colonial world face. Um, so actually with, with that in mind, I, I'd like to kind of shift to the kind of historical focus of your book first before then going in and, and, and talking a bit more about uh, kind of how Nigeria's history underpins some of the uh, current issues that the country faces and some of the current challenges to the U.S.-Nigeria relationship. So you have a line in your book where you say, the British created the state of Nigeria. They did not, could not, and had no sustained interest in developing a nation. Can you explain what you mean by this? Because I think uh, in, in kind of a, a lot of Western policy circles, we often take the two to go hand in hand, right? Nation state with, you know, with a hyphen, we think of it as one entity. And we think that this is how, um, you know, that this is how international relations, the Westphalian system um, should be, uh, should be kind of conducted and understood. This is the natural order of things. So I, I'd like you to, to talk a bit there about kind of what did Nigeria's uh, state formation process look like? Yeah, to me, uh, it's, it's, it's absolutely fascinating uh, to look at um, the British colonial presence in what is now Nigeria. 
you know, it's often said uh, that the British acquired an empire in a fit of absent-mindedness. Uh, in the case of in the case of Nigeria, uh, not so much absent-mindedness as a kind of incoherence. Um, they established a colony in Lagos uh, in 1860, 61. Uh, primarily to provide protection for uh, Christian converts uh, against a background of the breakdown of the Yoruba state system. They acquired the territory in the east, what is now an oil patch, uh, at the behest of a private company uh, that was uh, engaged in, in establishing a palm oil industry. And then finally, they acquired the north primarily to keep the Germans who were then in the Cameroons and the French out. So essentially for um, strategic reasons that had much more to do with Europe than it, did, than it did with Africa. Now these territories that the British acquired previously had never been part of, of a single entity. And in fact, there were, I guess it is, uh, more than 350 um, uh, separate uh, ethnic groups all of which speak uh, different languages, many of which are unintelligible to each other. And these, these territories had never had anything in common uh, uh, in, in, in the past. They were amalgamated uh, into a single territory called Nigeria, primarily as a matter of bureaucratic convenience. Um, the, the area along the coast uh, had had uh, contact with Europe um, since, since the 17th century, was already more developed uh, than the rest of what would become Nigeria, and therefore generated tax revenue. Uh, the thought was that uh, tax revenue from the south uh, could compensate for the lack of ta uh, tax revenue uh, in the north. And a cardinal principle of British governance all along was that um, colonial governance was never to be a charge to the British taxpayer. Uh, in other words, uh, British rule in Nigeria was to be paid for entirely by Nigerians uh, uh, and not by England, Scotland, or Wales. Um, okay, uh, little tiny British uh, bureaucracy Lord Lugard, who was eventually became governor general of United Nigeria, concluded that if the, the, the various parts of Nigeria were amalgamated into a single block, um, uh, governance and particularly tax revenue could be collected in a more efficient way. Uh, so this block of territory acquired a name, Nigeria, uh, which was provided by his wife, uh, Flora Lewis, who was a correspondent for the Times of London, and she invented the name. Uh, there is nothing indigenous about the name Nigeria, uh, and there, the 350 different ethnic groups that made it up uh, were not consulted about anything, uh, uh, so that the Nigerian state, as it were, is an altogether uh, artificial British creation. Uh, it's not something which, um, uh, which was internally generated. There's another dimension to this that I find really quite interesting, and that has to do uh, with, um, uh, with an independence movement. Uh, in some colonial territories, Algeria, for example, or Kenya, another example, uh, an independence movement played an important role in, uh, in nation building, uh, not so in Nigeria. In Nigeria, the independence movement was basically uh, opposed to racism, opposed to colonialism, but it was not for Nigeria. In other words, the so-called founding fathers of Nigeria very often had a pan-African optic, not a specifically Nigerian uh, optic. And in the late colonial period, and in that matter, in the, the early post-independence period, 
politics in Nigeria were not national. They essentially were ethnic. And what you had was politics dominated by the three largest ethnic groups, which altogether are about half the population, um, largely excluding the other half of the population. But again, without much vision or of a coherent or unified um, state. Uh, now the British obviously had no interest in creating uh, a, uh, uh, a Nigerian national identity. I would suggest that history essentially precluded the development of a, uh, of a, of a nation state made all the worse by two post-independence developments. Uh, the first was the Civil War from 1967 to 1970, which as it, uh, uh, as it unfolded, more and more acquired an ethnic and religious dimension. You had the Christian Igbo essentially trying to establish an independent state. You had uh, the, uh, the North, uh, uh, and the West oppo opposing that. At the same time, oil came on board, generating unimaginable amounts of wealth, but with no institution strong enough to manage or control the wealth. That led to essentially a free-for-all amongst the various competing elites for state capture, which they succeeded uh, in doing, putting at the top of, the, um, uh, uh, of Nigeria, uh, a competing at, yet at the same time cooperating elites, which had no interest in the development of a coherent national polity. No comparison at all, for example, with the founding fathers in the United States, uh, where uh, amongst the 13 colonies, the elites that dominated each of them certainly were self-interested, but they ended up with a vision of a United States as something that would prom promote the interests of everyone. Um, that sense doesn't exist uh, in Nigeria. Yeah, and, and I think it's interesting, and I, and I believe you draw this comparison a couple times in your book, but, um, you know, this notion uh, that the, the Nigerian founding fathers, people like Azekiwe, Bello, were, were kind of really focused on pan-Africanism, anti-racism, anti-colonialism and such, um, that doesn't necessarily preclude a nation-building project, right? In, in the uh, cases of both um, Ghana as well as Tanzania, um, kind of the, the founding fathers of those nations, if you will, um, you know, Kwame Nkrumah and, and, and the former and um, uh, Julius Nyerere in the case of the latter, you know, both were very, um, you know, very kind of invested in Pan-Africanism in this kind of global anti-colonial, anti-racist struggle. They saw themselves as kind of, you know, liberationists in a sense that they were part of this larger African project, um, but they were also very much nation builders. And so, you know, kind of socialism went hand in hand with Pan-Africanism, went hand in hand with nation building. Um, and I think you could argue that over the years, maybe the socialism has been dropped a bit and maybe the Pan-Africanism has been dropped a bit in the cases of these two countries, but there is still kind of a nation building project that for whatever reason, I guess in the case of Nigeria, that just wasn't as much of a focus for the kind of the, the anti-colonial elites in the late colonial era. Um, and also, as you note, um, right, the British had, uh, it, it wasn't just that they weren't interested in, in creating a Nigerian nation, it was also that they had a rather hurried departure, right? Um, could you talk a bit about that? Maybe what, what influenced the British to leave Nigeria and what they left Nigeria with? Yeah, isn't it? It's, 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 it's absolutely fascinating. Um, Nigeria became independent in 1960. Um, as late as 1955-1956, uh, prevailing opinion uh, in London was that independence for Nigeria no doubt would occur someday, but far in, uh, in the future. And then uh, in 1960, uh, uh, the British abruptly decided to end the colonial project. Uh, and having made that decision, 
uh, proceeded to leave Nigeria as fast as they could. Now, what brought about the British change in view? Um, factors that have nothing to do with Africa and that I find to be quite interesting. Uh, the Macmillan government and its immediate predecessors were very concerned uh, about the uh, preservation of the United Kingdom as a great power. And in the immediate post-war period, uh, the feeling was that the empire was an important element of a claim to great power status. This was true even after the independence uh, of India uh, and, uh, and Pakistan. What changed that? Uh, a couple of things. First of all, British acquisition of nuclear weapons. And British acquisition of nuclear weapons suddenly provided another basis, a more compelling basis uh, for great power status. Secondly, the Algeria war and then, at the same time, a seemingly uh, vibrant independence movement in the Gold Coast. Uh, so suddenly, empire became a drag, um, a drag on the exchequer, and particularly looking at Algeria, the potential for um, significantly undermining uh, the, the power and the position uh, of the United Kingdom, should you end up with a essentially a colonial war. Um, British also paid attention to what was going on in Vietnam, uh, which was a, uh, a similar phenomenon. So having made the decision that uh, they were going to leave Nigeria, they cobbled together very quickly uh, uh, conferences uh, in which a system of governance that essentially was modeled after Westminster was applied uh, to the whole country, a system of governance that had antecedents that went back to the, uh, to, uh, to the post-World War I period, elements, elements of it, but they formalized it and uh, essentially providing something to which they could turn Nigeria over while at the same time preserving their economic interests in the country. Uh, so from a British perspective, the sooner they could get out, the better. And by essentially establishing Westminster polit political institutions with no African indigenous roots at all, um, but nevertheless, with the buy-in of the elites that benefited from them, they could preserve their economic position. Right, and, and the, the result of this kind of, this both this state creation and then as well, um, the kind of uh, abrupt or hurried departure of the British and, and arguably their kind of uh, neo-colonial perspective and, and efforts to kind of keep, keep influence and retain their um, kind of uh, ability to secure their economic interests in Nigeria. The, the result of this, um, you use the term is a, a pre-Bendel archipelago. Um, that that's kind of to, the best way to describe Nigeria today is not as a nation state, but as a pre bendel archipelago of elites. So for, for our viewers who aren't as uh, familiar with the history of the Anglican or Catholic churches, wondering if you could describe quickly what you mean by pre bendelism and, and how that applies to Nigeria today. Essentially, um, the, the British system uh, that they left behind uh, started to collapse after about three years. And by 1965, um, there was um, a series of military coups that led to the Civil War, uh, which led to military dictatorship uh, and essentially uh, uh, the end of a Westminster system. Okay, uh, under those circumstances, who benefited? The country dating back to even uh, pre-colonial days, very often had a social organization uh, that amounted to patronage and clientage. These patronage clientage networks, of course, were headed by elites. These elites competed with each other furiously, but they also cooperated with each other just enough 
to keep the state together. Why? Because the state was the means by which wealth, particularly oil revenue and office, could be divided up amongst them. Notice there is no sense of an overarching sense of obligation to um, the Nigerian people. Now, what does this have to do with prebendalism? Uh, uh, prebends are cathedral offices to be found amongst both Anglican and Roman Catholic cathedrals in which the holder of a prebend has a right to a share of the income of the institution, a right to a share, not as compensation for any services that he might be, uh, that he might provide. And as a way of thinking, the elites who still dominate Nigeria operate from a mindset that they are entitled to a, the, the share of national wealth that they have managed to acquire. But they do not in return have to provide services to the Nigerian people. In other words, it's independent of the Nigerian people. Um, what is different about prebendalism from patronage clientage networks that you see elsewhere in the world is the sense of entitlement, uh, the sense that uh, it's part of the, of the natural order of things, that if you are at the top of these various patronage clientage networks, you are entitled to a share of the wealth that you have access to. Great, thank you. Yeah, that's a, that's a very useful discussion, um, an explanation of, of this concept. So I, now I, on I, the, the, the second part, right. the archipelago. Yes, um, thank you. Yeah, that's, um, that was that way of thinking. Uh, I first came across in uh, various analyses prepared uh, for the federal government some years ago. Uh, and central to it is the idea that formal government authority by no means covers the, the entire state, but is rather restricted to certain islands. Islands, not in a sea of ungoverned spaces, but rather in a sea of spaces that are governed by other entities. Now those other entities can range from traditional rulers uh, to criminal organizations, uh, to jihadi groups, uh, to warlords. If you look at Nigeria, the islands that the government can actually, actually exercise authority over, the most important is a kind of corridor from Lagos to Ibadan to Abuja to Kano, then another over in the oil patch, and then most of the, uh, of the state capitals. It's, it's interesting that in the struggle against Boko Haram in the state of Borno, right now, the army is following a strategy of essentially fortified hamlets left over from, from, right. from the Vietnamese war. Right. Where in effect, what they have done is that they have ceded control of the countryside to, in that case, uh, uh, Boko Haram. This is a pattern that is more explicit now in Borno, uh, but could be found elsewhere uh, in the country as well. Yeah. And I think arguably you're seeing a lot of that as well with the kind of the growing insecurity in the middle belt, but also the Northwest where yes. there are all yes. these concerns over kind of 
uh, bandits, which is a very ill-defined term, but what's clear is that the the kind of the writ of the federal government doesn't really extend outside of, like you said, those some of the the major cities. And even I mean, even the Abuja Kano corridor these days is is much more you know much more dangerous to traverse um, than it was several years ago. I, I did oh, that's, it. Uh, oh, that's yeah. that's that's absolutely right. Um, yeah. uh, and in fact, um, there's a little story I like to tell. Um, that may or may not shed some light on how much things have changed. When I first served in Nigeria in the late 80s, uh, the embassy was in Lagos. And while I was there, a group of three female officers from the embassy set out to do a familiarization trip to Northern Nigeria. They set out in an embassy vehicle with an embassy driver, lots of water, uh, and uh, lots of, um, uh, of gasoline, should they run out of gasoline. No security at all, and no security was necessary. Right. Uh, now, this was during uh, the, uh, a period of military, uh, military government. Nevertheless, the breakdown um, had not... Uh, or was not anywhere near as visible as it is now. In fact, uh, you, you were talking about travel from Lagos to Ibadan. Um, people do still do it, but they do it with great reluctance. Um, uh, and this is between two of the largest cities in the country. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, the, the kidnapping, I mean, it's really kind of become an epidemic there. I hate to use that term, um, but it's it's really, um, I mean, it's, it's one thing that you, you see kind of throughout the country and it's just become such a, a kind of an ingrained problem. And, and it's, you know, it seems that Nigerians really have to kind of take that into account whenever they're traveling. It's, it's just part of daily life now. And uh, my, my brief experience traveling, I travel on some of the roads up, up north um, in 2019 around Kano, Joss and Abuja. Um, and, you know, there, there were soldiers, there were lots of checkpoints actually, but uh, they didn't exactly inspire confidence um, yeah. so much as they they were asking for handouts. So that kind of goes into, as you're saying, um, not quite sure if that's necessarily a, a pre bendalist uh, practice insofar as they are at least theoretically providing security. But um, there's a lot, as we've seen with, you know, the NSARS protests and, and other movements in recent years, there's definitely kind of a, a, a fragile social contract, I think, between the security services and the population. Um, and with the rise of, of, of militias and such, um, you know, I would say there's virtually no social contract at all, and would, that's that's a major that's a major part right. of the problem. So I'm being um, too generous, perhaps. <laughs> well, I mean, um, popular opposition uh, and fear of the security services means that there's very little cooperation with them, uh, and um, I think most Nigerians will have as little to do. Um, with with the police or the army as they possibly can. Yeah, that that certainly seems, and I, I think you know, I imagine it 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 seems to vary a bit from region to region, but on the whole, I think that uh, there's certainly not much public trust and public confidence in those institutions, which is obviously uh, going to both kind of create the conditions for the rise of insecurity and insurgencies, but also exacerbate those conditions once they're there. Um, Absolutely. But, that, uh, that, that anecdote you gave about um, your, your colleagues traveling through Nigeria, northern Nigeria, um, I guess it was back in the, the 1990s, you said, I think that's a, that's a good kind of um, segue into this question of U.S.-Nigeria relations and, and particularly how U.S. diplomats operate within Nigeria, which is a big focus of your book. So for starters, I'm wondering if you can give us a, a bit of kind of an overview of how you think the U.S.-Nigeria relationship has evolved since independence. Um, you have a very interesting part in your discussion of the Biafran War, which you mentioned earlier, where you said that in some ways, um, U.S. policy kind of, um, it, it got the, the worst of, of both worlds. And so far as we, you know, uh, American policy since 1960 has been to, um, you know, promote and respect and seek to preserve the integrity of the Federal Republic of Nigeria. And so we, we backed the government in what was then Lagos, uh, then the capital, um, against the secessionists in Biafra. But there was also a real kind of outpouring of support and sympathy for the Biafrans from American civil society, um, from activists, from um, you know faith leaders, and, and from politicians. Um, and this is certainly not the first time uh, that we've seen where uh, a, a difference um, uh, between kind of how um, activist circles in the U.S. Um, approach uh, an issue in Africa and, and, and what the U.S. government policy is. Thinking of things like Darfur or South Sudan. 
Absolutely. Um, and and so the the impression then was you know well we, we were backing the federal government and so the Biafran secessionists uh, you know were not happy with that but um, no one in Lagos really thought that we really had their back because there was so much kind of rhetorical support in Washington and in elite circles for the Biafrans so that's just that's that's one kind of major I guess um, a challenge I would say or at least one major um, kind of point a uh, historical point in the US Nigeria relationship that I think a lot of people in, in Abuja um, certainly seem to to remember to this day but I'm wondering if you can talk more broadly about kind of what have been what have been some of the successes of the US Nigeria relationship but also what have some of the challenges been including um, you know how have how have diplomats yourself included um, either kind of uh, adapted to the realities of Nigeria or perhaps failed to uh, adapt to the political realities of the country. Yeah, um, I, I would argue that the adaptation to the realities of the country uh, by, uh, by us as policymakers and diplomats uh, has been limited. The assumption has been that Nigeria is a nation state in the Westphalian sense that say Canada is a nation state or, uh, or Australia is a nation state. That meant that the relationship was focused overwhelmingly on the central government, be it a military government or a nominally civilian government in the capital. Who do diplomats mostly talk to? The presidency, the foreign ministry, certain other government agencies. Yes, it's true. There is limited outreach to the business community, very little outreach to religious leaders or traditional rulers or even governors of states. Why? Because in the Westphalian state system, relations are conducted between central governments. Now, we say that our relationship is much broader than that, that it's with the Nigerian people. But the emphasis or the focus has been on the central government. Now, there are other programs. Um, there, are, um, there are aid programs. Um, there is uh, some outreach to the media. Um, we had, uh, at one time, uh, a network of so-called American corners. There were 18 of them scattered around the country when I was there. Uh, many of them are now gone. Uh, but what they provided, amongst other things, was certain basic information about the United States and of particular importance, internet connectivity. Mm -hmm. Staffed, not by Americans, but by Nigerians. So the, the utility was limited and certainly nowhere near as effective as the British Council, uh, which had somewhat similar uh, 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 installations, though not nearly as many uh, as, uh, as, as we did. I would maintain that a focus on the presidency, the foreign ministry, to a certain extent, the Ministry of Defense, means that security issues tend to predominate because amongst other things, that's what the presidency, the foreign ministry and the ministry of defense are most concerned about. And therein is a major source of anxiety on my part because if you look at what happened in Vietnam, Afghanistan, Iraq, Syria. The focus on security issues as defined by host governments 
very often led to poor policy decisions made in Washington. And I think very few people would argue that Vietnam, Afghanistan, or Iraq were, uh, were, were uh, stunning American successes. In the case of Vietnam, Afghanistan, and Iraq, there was very little granular knowledge of how those countries and societies worked. Same is true of Nigeria. Um, and a reason why I wrote the book is I think a more granular understanding of how Nigeria works is central to developing a policy, a, a American policy towards Nigeria that actually promotes our, our, our interests. Um, it's why I'm extremely nervous uh, when either Nigerians or Americans advocate a closer security relationship. Mm -hmm. Because we're talking about a relationship with the army, the police, uh, the state security services, all of which are agencies uh, which most Nigerians apparently uh, have very little confidence in and very often a great deal of hostility towards. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and, and what's interesting um, is that uh, this is thinking, you know, what immediately comes to mind is, is Boko Haram, right? In the Islamic State, West Africa province, the, the organization has has splintered since, since roughly 2016. Um, you know, Nigeria is often talked about as part of kind of the environment of the war on terror. And yes. there's, there's, you know, a, a, a kind of a big debate among scholar, scholars and analysts about how much does the kind of Islamic State's relationship with, um, you know, one faction of Boko Haram, how much does that actually influence their, um, you know, yes. their behavior, their strategies? Um, as you know, you know, there's not at present any evidence that, um, you know, that they're planning attacks that directly threaten the U.S., you know, that they're planning any operations outside of, of kind of, of, of Nigeria or of their kind of area of operations in Lake Chad. But the question is, could that change? What's the best way to approach that? And, and what, I, what I find interesting about Nigeria is that on the one hand, the, um, the Nigerian government is, has always been um, at pains to emphasize and, and try to paint Boko Haram as you know, essentially a foreign threat, saying you know, this, is not a, this is not a, res, a, a kind of a Nigerian problem, right? This is Al Qaeda or the Islamic State coming in and they're, you know, they're recruiting people and they're planting bad ideas. And, and there's obviously an incentive for, the, for Abuja to, to say, no, this isn't our problem. This is, you know, this is, this is a foreign terrorist issue, uh, you know, essentially. Um, but at the same time, Nigeria hasn't asked for or kind of received the same degree of actual kind of operational cooperation with American forces as you see in something like Somalia, where, you know, Navy SEALs and, and Green Berets and such are actually on the ground. Um, well, Except now, you know, now they're being pulled out with the, the Trump administration's decision. But there's there's a lot of actual kind of close security cooperation. It seems like what Ni the Nigerian government is asking for is essentially give us goodies, right? Give us the ability, give us the hardware and the money to defeat Boko Haram on our own. Um, but we don't actually, you know, they don't actually want a strong kind of uh, U.S. kind of troop presence in the country. And when it was revealed, uh, when they had the the big um, kind of uh, the multinational joint task force um, uh, kind of offensive against Boko Haram in, in 2015, um, when revelations came out that, that Ibn Barlow, the South African mercenary and his men had been, you know, kind of supporting that, uh, th those operations, it was somewhat embarrassing for the Nigerian government, right? So I, I'm, I, I'm curious if you could talk a bit about what you think, um, kind of how, how Abuja, how the military, how the Ministry of Defense, um, you know, talks about Boko Haram, what they want from the U.S. in that fight against Boko Haram, and what they don't want, um, and kind of what you see the the future of of that challenge. Is there any way to really contain it? Is there anything the U.S. can do better, or do we just have to kind of live with the fact that this is, for the time being, um, you know, a challenge that's kind of ingrained in northeastern Nigeria, um, and and you know, given the current trajectory, the Nigerian government just doesn't seem to be. Um, doing what's necessary or, uh, to, to actually address this issue? Um, to, take, to take the simplest, the most straightforward first, 
um, what does the Nigerian government want from us? Um, essentially to write checks uh, and to, uh, to provide military materiel, uh, but without, uh, without any sort of residual control. And in fact, the rough patches in the formal relationship uh, mostly has been over the US declining to sell uh, to the Nigerians um, certain types of, um, of military equipment. Uh, no, the Nigerians do not want uh, large numbers uh, of uh, American military uh, uh, in the country. Uh, the question then becomes why? Uh, and uh, and the reasons why are almost entirely speculative. Uh, but there is concern, uh, certainly amongst human rights advocates uh, in Nigeria, that basically the Nigerian establishment is not interested in having outsiders observe how they actually run the country and how in fact military assistance, particularly if it were money, uh, would end up in private pockets. Um, so that's the, that's the easy part. The much harder part is what is the nature of the Islamist insurrection in Northern Nigeria. As you quite accurately said, uh, the line from Abuja, really pretty much since the very beginning, has been that Boko Haram and associated organizations are a branch of the international Islamist assault uh, on, on the West. That it is that Nigeria is the, a theater where that is happening, but it is not a Nigerian problem. Others, and I put myself in this camp, others see the Islamist revolt in the North as part of a very long tradition dating back to uh, uh, before the British of periodic Islamist revival that incorporates within it a end of times scenario, the creation of God's kingdom on earth through the establishment of a polity conducted according to Islamic law. This is an image that particularly amongst the impoverished in the North can be pretty compelling. And it is how much popular support these Islamist movements have in the North is very hard to judge. Um, estimates run from anywhere from two to 15% of the population. Consider that the population of the North is 100 million. Even if it's 5%, that provides a pool for recruitment that would seem to be inexhaustible. And these Islamist movements in the North seem to have very little difficulty uh, in, uh, uh, in, in recruitment. Yeah. In other words, there is an element of popular support, just as there's an element of popular support for the Taliban in Afghanistan or of uh, the Viet Cong in, uh, in Vietnam, or for that matter, the Islamic State in, uh, uh, in Iraq. That's why I keep going back to the need for a granular understanding, which we don't have, uh, of these movements and the context in which they operate. Yeah, that's a great point. And, and I think it's also important to stress in the context of insurgencies like you know, Boko Haram's uh, support is kind of an ambiguous term, right? It doesn't, yeah. you know, they're, they're true kind of ideological, uh, you know, people who are really committed to it. But, you know, when you're talking about an insurgency, what support often comes down to is, is almost kind of an exhaustion of the will to resist, right? It's just a question of, you know, if you've got a, a rapacious military that's, you know, not even particularly present, 
most of the times and doesn't really provide security on the one hand. And then you have Islamist insurgents who provide a modicum of security maybe in governance, um, as certainly it seems that this one faction of Boko Haram is, is doing, you know, kind of creating a bit of a proto-state. Um, the question of support really comes down to, you know, am I going to cooperate with the security forces or am I going to cooperate with, with the Islamist militants, right? It doesn't necessarily that's, mean, yeah. That's exactly uh, right. And then you throw into it the criminal element. Right. Um, <clears throat> which which uh, I believe we, we may have seen recently with this this kidnapping of, of, of the boys in, in Kankara, in Northwestern Nigeria, right? Exactly. Possibly a, um, I mean, details are still, uh, there, there, I have a lot of questions about what happened, but you know, over over a hundred schoolboys were kidnapped in northwestern Nigeria. It looked like maybe initially it was bandits who did it, but then the Boko Haram faction of Abu Bakr Shakao claimed credit, so raises the possibility of some degree of cooperation. Um, you know, whether one-off or more sustained between uh, the Islamist militants and these bandits, <laughs> or in that particular case, whether the operation was carried out by bandits who then essentially sold the boys to the highest bidder. Uh, and essentially, the state the state government outbid Boko Haram. That's mm -hmm. a, um, uh, a a pot potential explanation. Yeah, yeah, it'll, it'll it'll be interesting to you know as hopefully more details emerge. But um, I, I also when we're talking about this kind of thing, you've also got the revenge syndrome underway. Um, it would appear, for example, that some how many we have no idea. But some of the female suicide bombers were operating with their, with their own agency. That in other words, they were quite deliberately serving as suicide bombers to exact revenge for the killing of their father's husband's sons. Right. Yeah, and that's, that's an important point. I think it also goes to this, this question of kind of ungoverned spaces, which really took hold after 9-11, where, you know, Africa was kind of painted as this land, this large swaths of territory where there was no law, kind of the state of nature. And this is where, um, you know, the, the Islamist insurgencies would, 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 take, would take form. And actually, I think as a kind of more nuanced understanding has developed over the years, it's clear that often, um, you know, the presence of security forces that are, you know, very heavy handed or rapacious, um, you know, while also not delivering the goods that are kind of the you know, that one important half of the social contract that, you know, in that sense, the, the state presence can actually be a, a kind of driver of insurgency. And even when there isn't a state presence, as you said, you know, other, there are other forms of governance, whether we want to call it sub-state governance, local governance. Right. Um, so I, I think that is an important point. I appreciate you highlighting that in the book, that Nigeria isn't a land of ungoverned spaces, but there is that kind of archipelago effect. And when you're talking about the actual internationally recognized state authority, um, you know, it's, it's actual uh, kind of, um, it's actual and, control is relatively limited in places. And, and everything we're talking about is against a background of exploding population, a youth bulge, um, a food security crisis, and the consequences of climate change. Mm -hmm. um, I find a very interesting figure that now 40% of the arable land in Nigeria is subject to periodic drought. Mm -hmm. So yeah. you have these, these objective factors uh, that are also there providing a huge amount of pressure uh, on, uh, uh, on, on, on political, religious, uh, and economic issues. Yeah, exactly. So it's, it's a, uh... You know, many challenges, both, as you say, ecological, demographic, political, kind of, um, that Nigeria will have to grapple with for over the next, you know, the coming decades. So for, we, we're, we're about running out of time here, but I think one last question I have, uh, which, which goes into this, uh, you know, kind of uh, the main thrust of your book in many ways, which is that U.S. diplomacy has been insufficient to kind of grapple with the realities of, of Nigeria. And so you're calling for a more granular a more granular understanding of kind of the Nigerian socio-political dynamics and um, calling for uh, U.S. officials to kind of look outside the corridors of Abuja or maybe the, you know, the Lagos of Ibadan corridor, try to get a better understanding of what's going on around the country. Um, it seems that, you know, one of the challenges that we have is, um, you know, and I, I wrote about this recently in a, in a Hudson report, um, a paper for their Look Ahead series, that was based in no small part on some of the conversations we've, we've had over the years, which is that 
you know, after the Benghazi attacks, it's become, you know, very rare for American officials to kind of leave their kind of armored, armored compounds um, in many parts of the world. And, you know, Africa, absolutely, there are many countries there where there are really intense restrictions on travel, you know, not for, for no reason, as we've talked about, even the highways in Nigeria are perennially, uh, you know, plagued with, with, with bandits. Um, but that really limits how much, um, you know, American officials can kind of engage with anyone other than, like you said, the Ministry of Defense, the presidency, you know, his chief of staff. Um, and it seems like there's, you know, this might in many ways be as much a political issue as a bureaucratic one, um, just insofar as I, you know, I'm not sure if any administration is going to risk the political capital of, you know, what happens if an ambassador is again, tragically harmed, you know, that, well, that can be. I mean, that's, that, that, is, that is exactly right. Um, yeah. the, the roots of the current culture of risk avoidance uh, are pretty deep. And the tremendous increase in the influence of the Bureau of Diplomatic Security um, within the State Department uh, I think is something that uh, that needs to be looked at very seriously because I would argue that in fact our diplomats could travel around the country to a much greater extent, could engage with these decentralized centers of real power in Nigeria. We know how to do it and the Israelis know how to do it. But the point is, it costs money. Mm -hmm. It's a matter of money. So I would also suggest that the amount of money that is involved is peanuts compared to making major policy mistakes. I, I agree there, certainly. So if, if uh, I'll, I'll let you have the last word here. If if you had. Uh, if you know, if you had an administration that was willing to risk the minimal, you know, financial capital as well as had the, you know, political will to kind of um, uh, to to kind of reform how the U.S. does Nigeria and Africa, um, and particularly using Nigeria, I guess here, um, or sorry, how the U.S. does diplomacy in Africa, particularly using uh, Nigeria here as the case study, um, how would you urge? Um, that's our that's our uh, our warning. Um, how how would you uh, how would you recommend that the U.S. Um, go about kind of adopting a more decentralized uh, um, form of diplomacy in Nigeria? What policy uh, changes would you recommend? Um, essentially, a decentralization of our um, our diplomatic presence in Nigeria. Um, we at one time had a network of consulates. Uh, um, far more extent, well, right now there's only one. Uh, we used to have consulates in Ibadan, in, uh, in Kaduna, in Port Harcourt. Um, there was a, an effort when Hillary Clinton was Secretary of State um, to, to reestablish a consulate in Kano. It was shot down again, uh, largely by the Bureau of Diplomatic Security and the arguments that it, that it advanced. But you know, I'm very hopeful. Uh, the new ambassador to the UN who will be sitting in the cabinet is Linda Thomas Greenfield, who does have a granular knowledge of Africa. She spent most of her career there. You have as the new head of the CIA, Bill Burns, also a career diplomat who understands extremely well what the security issues are. In other words, I would suggest that for the first time in a very long time, we have at the very pinnacle of an, uh, a Washington administration, uh, people who do have experience and background and who understand what, uh, what the issues are uh, uh, and that leads to my hope that we're not going to have a repeat of Benghazi, which in effect became a domestic American political issue. Great. Well, thank you. I, I'm glad that we can end on, on a slightly hopeful note after what was a, a largely uh, pessimistic conversation. So.
This has been wonderful. Um, I thank you so much, Ambassador Campbell, for joining us today. Um, thank you all for everyone who's, who's watching this online. As I mentioned, the book is called Nigeria and the Nation State, Rethinking Diplomacy with the Post-Colonial World. Um, thank you, Ambassador Campbell, for joining today. It's been a pleasure. Thank you so much for having me.